E Hartree-Fock is known that is 2 H11 plus J11, correct? That all of you agree? It is a very simple thing because you have 1 1 bar anti symmetrized 1 1 bar, so exchange part will become 0, so you will have only the Coulomb part, okay. This can be of course written in terms of epsilon 1 as well. So this can be written also in terms of twice epsilon 1 minus J11. So, so there are different ways of writing this. So let me uh, write this down that the epsilon 1 is of course H11 plus J11, okay. So epsilon 1 is nothing but chi 1 F chi 1. So chi 1 can be either 1 or 1 bar, you can take any one of them. So let us say 1, so 1 alpha F 1 alpha. Okay, alpha alpha is integrated, then expand f. So, if you expand f, you will get 1 h 1 plus the other one which is 1 1 bar anti symmetrized 1 1 bar. I hope you remember the epsilon formula. So, epsilon i is chi i f chi i. So, I want these are the things in the Hartree Fog we have already done. Then expand f. So, if you expand f, you have chi i h chi i plus sum over all the occupied orbitals, let us say B, chi i, chi B, anti symmetrized chi i, chi I hope you remember this formula for orbital energies, right. So, it has a, it has interaction with all other occupied orbitals. So, when I is one of the occupied orbitals, then of course, if it B is equal to I, it is 0. So, you do not have to do worry about it. So, the only other occupied orbital is 1 bar. Okay, for any one of them, if I take 1 alpha, then 1 beta I have to take care. So, this is basically nothing but H11 plus J11. So, that is your epsilon 1 and E Hartree Fock is 2 H11 plus J11. So, that can be also written of 2 times epsilon 1, which is 2 H11 plus 2 J11 minus J11. So, either of these formulas are right. So, this is the, you can, this, so this is correct and you can then write either this or this. I hope it is clear. So, if you write in terms of 2 H11, you have a plus J11. If you write in terms of 2 epsilon 1, you will have minus J11 for the Hartree Fock energy. This is for a simple case of a 1 1 bar where, where Hartree Fock is a 2 electron problem, right. So, so, on this note, let us now write epsilon 2. Remember, epsilon 2 is an unoccupied orbital, okay. So, first term will be H22 as usual. Note here we are writing the or energy of one particular orbital. So, there is no summation over orbitals and all that, one particular spin orbital. Then I have to sum over all the occupied orbitals. But now the electron is in this spin orbital 2. So, the other occupied orbitals are 1 and 1 bar. So, there is an extra term. So, I will write this as 2, 1, anti symmetrize 2, 1 plus 2 1 bar anti symmetrized 2 1 bar, correct for epsilon 2. So, this is now your H 2 2. Now, if I do this expansion, you will get J 1 2, right. But you will also have one term which is K12. So, so what is 2121? 2121 is nothing but 2121 minus 2112, right? Both will survive because they are all both alpha spins now. So, I have assumed that the 2 is alpha spin. So, you have to first assume whether it is alpha spin or beta spin. So, either way it is okay. So, then this is my J 1 2 and this is my K 1 2. I hope you can see this, this, this kind of symmetry you should see quickly. So, 2 1 1 2 is nothing but 1 2 2 1 which is nothing but 1 2 1 2 
you know yesterday last time we also used 1 2 1 2 sk 1 all of these are identical okay so you remember your 2 1 2 1 2 1 1 2 is nothing but 1 2 2 1 and then I can interchange these 2 and 1 I can say 1 1 2 2. So these are for real orbitals and in our questions these are all real orbitals. So for real orbitals lots of symmetries are there. So they are all equal and the either of them is called K 1 2 and J 1 2 is 1 1 1 2 1 2 okay. So this is minus K 1 2 so I wrote this. However, if I do this, you have only J term because now when I exchange the beta and alpha orthogonality will make it 0, okay. So my epsilon 2 is H22 plus 2J12 minus K12, okay. So I will just keep these two results here. So, 1 is epsilon 1. So, then epsilon 1 is H11 plus J11. And E Hartree-Fock is 2 epsilon 1 minus J11, okay. Now, what I have to find out is the rest of the term which is 2 2 bar H 2 2 bar. Because you remember I, my expression was 2 2 bar H minus E Hartree Fock 2 2 bar. I am going to subtract this after I calculate this, right. So, again, if you put this expansion by Slater rules, you will get this as 2 times H 2 2 because you have H 2 H term is very simple 2 times H 3 2. And then you have the anti symmetrized 2 2 bar 2 2 bar. Okay, which is nothing but 2 H 2 2 plus J 2. Okay, this is anti symmetric 2 2 bar 2 2 bar, right. I do not have to write half and all that because you know only one pair counts. Finally, they will be identical. Actual Slater rule has half and sum over all, sum over both 2 and 2 bar. So, I am just writing only one term because they will all uh, um, you know be equal. So, it is 2 H 2 2 plus J 2 2. So, so now what I have to do I have to subtract this and this correct because what was my quantity that I wanted 2 2 bar H minus E Hartree Fock this is what I wanted. So, of course, when this is Hartree E Hartree Fock this is a number which comes out so that is a normalized determinant so that is 1. So, I have to basically subtract this from this. So, what I am first going to do write H 2 2 in terms of epsilon 2. Okay. So, now you see you look at epsilon 2. So, you write H 2 2 as epsilon 2 minus 2 J 1 2 plus K 1 2. Okay. And then, subs then, then put this here. So, your 2 2 bar H 2 2 bar in terms of epsilon 2 will then become 2 times epsilon 2 right minus 4 J 1 2 plus 2 K 1 2 plus J 2, okay. And now you have to just subtract. So, if you subtract then you will get this quantity. So, subtract these two this and this. So, you have 2 epsilon 2 minus 2 epsilon 1. So, 2 into epsilon 2 minus epsilon 1 and then write plus J 1 J 2 2 plus J 1 1. And then just write the same thing minus 4j12 plus 2k. It is a little bit of a manipulation, but it is it is it is it is a little difficult, I agree, but I thought I will just show you how to manipulate these quantities. So, once I can write, I can reach this term, I can easily write. Remember your E Hartree Fock is which is 1 1 bar H 1 1 bar is 2 epsilon minus J 1 1. I will warn you if you write 2 2 bar H 2 2 bar exactly like this, there is a tendency to write this also as 2 epsilon 2 minus J 2 2. That would be wrong. 
because this came because your Hartree-Fock potential had one one bar in the definition of Hartree-Fock potential, but not two. See, if you remember your Hartree-Fock potential, Fock operator, H plus V Hartree-Fock. The V Hartree-Fock was defined in terms of one and one bar. So, the orbital 1 and 1 bar and orbital 2 and 2 bar are not identical. So, you cannot simply say that this is 2 epsilon minus j 1 1, then write this as 2 epsilon 2 minus j 2 2. So, the other way to look at it is that this is your 2 electrons, this is your orbital 2, what is epsilon 2? If I put 1 electron here, that is epsilon 2. What would be the energy that this electron will face? Okay? So, that is h, that is of course its own interaction. H2, H22, one electron interaction, but plus Coulomb and exchange with these two electrons. And clearly, Coulomb is there with parallel as well as anti parallel. So, you have 2 J12, but parallel spins only can give exchange, so minus K12. So, that is what you got here. Right? So, even graphically, you can see. Whereas for epsilon 1, it is different. I am taking out an electron here, so the interaction is only with one, one electron, J11. And that has to be, you know, cannot be parallel. Whichever electron I am taking, the other one has to be opposite. So, there is only J11. So, it is only H11 plus J11. So, I hope, so that was one, some people have done this mistake. And after that, of course, you go into a spin. You cannot get it. So, the key thing is to write this properly and then also write this properly. This is easy actually. If you write it in terms of H and J, then you do not make a mistake. If you write in terms of epsilon, there is a tendency of making mistake. Because epsilon is defined in terms of Fock operator, which includes only occupied orbital. Whereas this expression is a generic expression. So, if you write in terms of H, there is no error. Your E Hartree Fock is also 2 H11 plus J11. This is 2 H22 plus J22. So, that is symmetric. Okay. But in terms of, so we are asking you to re express in terms of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. So, that is why all this complication is coming. Is it clear? All right. So, I think just in the last class yesterday that was, we actually ended by saying that E d c i is proportional to square root of n. That was one of the main thing that we did and hence it is not size extensive. Note again that we made a distinction between size extensive and size consistent. In this case, the fact that it is not size extensive is also related to the fact that it is not size consistent. But I told you that size consistency is something more. So, you require, you require size extensive. but also separation of the reference space itself. So, which is heart reform, which is this at this point it is heart reform. That the correct dissociation or the size correct size consistency behavior of the heart reform itself. So, in the case of H4 dimer, this is automatically satisfied okay, as it goes to H2 plus H2. So, the only issue is that since this is not size extensive, hence it is not size consistent. So, try to understand this. But there may be a situation where a theory is size extensive, but because the reference is not separating correctly, it is still not size consistent. So, in some way, it is understood that the size consistency is a, is a bigger requirement, is a more a stricter requirement than size extensivity. Okay? So, size extensivity can be defined even in interacting regime, that even when they are interacting, the energy of this energy of the system should be proportional to n. So, that is size extensivity. So, if it is not proportional to n, just as dci is not square root n, it is not size extensive. Okay? And that we saw in the last class that your dci energy for n H2 molecule was always becoming delta minus delta square plus n times k12 square, right? To the power so that was the that was the form that you are getting so please understand i have done it elaborately you should be able to get this thing from the correlation energy expression 
by diagonalizing iterative diagonalization and then solving the quadratic equation. And we have also taken the lowest root. You know, there is a question somebody asked. So this is of course the lowest root. In the quadratic equation, there are two roots. So this is the lowest root because we are looking at the ground state. Okay, but I think that apart, the point is, is the dependence of n in a wrong way, that it is comes under square root. And although we notice that the actual generic formulas looks like n times, including the uh, the, the formula for e-correlation, n times. But when we actually do this iterative solution, the final result has square root n stuck in here. And this is essentially the problem of DCI and all truncated CI for large systems. So whether it will, even if you do DQCI for large system, DQ is also not good enough because we try to understand why this happens because when I take a product of the wave function at a particular level, the dimer always has to have a higher level of excitation. So if I have quadruples, quadruple into quadruple will give you octuple. So no, no CI if you do at a consistent level for dimer and monomer will give you size consistency. So that means you have to do something for monomer, something for dimer and even then we realize that that coefficient has to be a quadratic, not linear. So there are two points that we highlighted. So the CI can never solve this problem of product separation unless you do full CI. If you do full CI and this is something that we do not want to show in a very elaborate mathematics, there are lots of cancellation and it gives a correct separation simply because it is exact. Uh, exact theories are of course correct. So we are discussing the, the theoretical model chemistry for approximate theories. When you develop approximate theories, uh, how will you do this? Okay?